Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you about change, transformation. Some familiar faces. Hi there. Um, change, transformation. Um, but also, I think I'm going to try and bring it to life after about 10 to 15 minutes of talking about some general principles. I really want to focus on my experience as being an HR leader within uh, the Royal Mail, which is an organisation where every one of you are customers, and not many organisations in the UK can say that. Everybody has someone that walks up their drive every day to post letters. Um, and I spent five years there, uh, most probably five fantastic years, uh, challenging years, where we changed everything in an organisation, which had 360 years of history, um, who basically didn't want to change. So I think there are lots of parallels. I think there's lots of things that I can bring to life and share with you. But I think I'll start off by just saying a little bit about uh, myself, first of all, um, and the organisation that I currently work with, or for, um, and that's the REC. So first piece of uh, part of audience participation, and there will be the odd moment. How many of you have heard of the REC? Can I have a show of hands? OK, about half. Basically, we are the trade body and the professional institute for the recruitment industry. And one of the reasons I took this job four years ago um, was because I think the industry needed to professionalise, it needed to develop, and it needed to enhance its reputation. So my message to you, and I'm not going to say a lot about the REC, is quite simple. When you go back to your operations and your organisations, can you make sure that any recruitment business, whether it's a search firm, whether it's your people that provide your temporary staff, or whether it's the organisations that you use to help you find professionals or academics, that they're members of the REC. And the reason for that is it gives you the opportunity to have some assurance. We basically uh, manage uh, the standards within the industry and we have a professional standards committee with the TUC and the CBI on it. And we deal with about uh, 190 complaints a month from candidates and clients about members of the REC. And we basically go through the process of making sure people adhere to our code of professional conduct. And the reason why I go out and talk to HR communities and procurement communities is because I'm keen for you to ask that question of your suppliers. Because that drives them into the fold. That means I can rise, rise the standards of the uh, profession uh, and the organisations within it. So that actually we, as an economy, benefit from having better facilitators in terms of recruitment and the movement of the talent across our economy. And you obviously get really high class, wonderful recruitment partners to work with. So that's the end of my broadcast. Um, as I said, I wanted to start off and talk a little bit about uh, your themes, really. Um, for me, when people start to talk about sustainability and survival, I think we're starting to get to a place where there are a range of things happening within your institutions. Normally the environment outside is changing and I think we are aware of, I'm aware of some of the things that you're going through but you're going to know uh, your current environment better than, our, mine, or than I do. So the environment's changing and it's changing fast. Um, the other challenge will be is that the pressure is building. So again, what you find in organisations is there's normally a period before big transformational change happens where people talk about it a lot, but don't actually do very much. They talk about change, you know, we're going to have to change, we're going to have to transform ourselves, otherwise we may not survive. But actually there's not a lot of action going on. There's not a lot of real change happening. We're tinkering around with things, but the, the, if you like, the, the language changes. And again, the thing I would say is, it's when people start to talk about and start to recognise we need to be agile, we need to be more responsive to the marketplace. And what does that mean? What does that look like? That you really start to get to the stage where we're at the tipping point. And the tipping point is really where we move from rhetoric to action. And having read Linda's report and what she said to you yesterday, I think as a sort of a, an industry or a sector, you seem to be in that place. I think you're getting to the tipping point where we move from thinking about this and talking about it to actually we've got to roll our sleeves up and actually start to change our institutions and our organisations. Um, and this is my take on some of the changing pressures in terms of your sector. And as um, uh, Ruth mentioned earlier on, 
prior to working in Royal Mail, I worked in strategic HR on my own consultancy. And I worked with a number of academic institutes. That was about eight or nine years ago. And even then, there was talk about we need to change and how can we get academics uh, to, to, to operate differently? How do we get academics to manage our institutions as if they were businesses? We had the whole conversation around how do we report people? How do we become more entrepreneurial? So it's been around in your sector for quite a while, I think. But now I think you're actually the customer's changing. You know, the funding mechanism is changing. It's moving from you know, the funding from the state to the student being the funder. And I think that must be quite exciting, quite challenging, quite an opportunity. Because you've actually got a customer that you can touch, that can make choice for themselves. You know, I've got a 17-year-old uh, who's just starting to think about university. Went to a careers fair the other day. And he seemed to be making his decision on which prospectus he picked up on about who was giving them out, and it seems to be attractive young women seemed to be the theme, so there might be a few hints in terms of your marketing. So he came back with a prospectus for Glasgow, and I said, why Glasgow? He said, she was very pretty, Dad. I went, right, okay, so, and what study, and he said he came back with Reading, I said, why Reading? And he went, well, my friend was talking to this girl, and she was really nice, and she gave me the perspective, and I said, I don't think they do international studies at Reading. He went, oh, really, don't they? So again, you know, your customer's not that discerning, but if you start to think about, you start to think about us as parents as well. You know, who talks to us about the choices our young people are going to make, about where they're going to invest their education? So again, I think there's a huge, exciting opportunity for you guys where it's not about talking to government and DfE and all those bureaucrats. Now it's actually starting to, well, the higher education for council and funding mechanism. That's about people turning up and saying, I'm going to invest my £9,000 in here or in this organisation. So I think that should be quite exciting and quite liberating. Again, there's lots of other things going on. You know, the whole debate about internationalisation and now we've got the government putting caps and overseas students, very helpful, at the same time as they're freeing you up, well, you can't bring as many in. But again, there's opportunities and threats in terms of thinking about how do we compete? How do we find the right mechanism to attract overseas students? How do we take our services overseas? How do we um, extract value from different marketplaces. I also think this is a big challenge. I spent a lot of time talking about jobs. You know, I did uh, Radio 4 yesterday, Radio 5, I did Breakfast TV last Friday, and we're a commentator on the jobs market. And one of the things, so I spent a lot of time going out to talk to private sector employers, and the thing that they keep saying, and I know you're most probably not going to like this, but they keep saying actually the output in terms of graduates is not what we want. And there's this rhetoric I've heard go on for years, which is, we're getting people with you know, good degrees, but actually their communication skills aren't great, they can't work as part of a team, and actually their employability skills aren't great. You know, I go out and talk to um, graduates and some private sector employers and go, how have you been prepared to go through an assessment centre? And who's helped you prepare your CV? And they sort of go, well, you know, I did four, three years or four years, but no one's quite got round to that yet. So again, I think there's something about uh, making sure that the offering, the output that you do as, a, as, as institutions um, are perhaps different than they've been historically. And the students are going to want more value. So um, I think there's a lot going on. And from an HR perspective, the other thing clearly must be, if you're going to differentiate yourselves around your academic prowess, then actually well, how do you attract and then retain the talent, the academic talent? Which means that you're in a global marketplace. Um, you know, do you pay differently? Do you think about attracting people and giving different type of packages for someone that's going to attract research funding? So how do you start, because again, when I was there, I can remember working with Northumbria about their pay scales, you know, pretty rigid. You know, the opportunity to flex and bring someone on and double the salary that their boss sort of frowned upon. Whereas in the private sector, that happens all the time. If you're really in a global marketplace and you're trying... So all I'm saying is, and I don't know your, your industry as well as you do, but it seems to me there's a lot of change that's sort of just about to come or is just coming. And I think that's clearly driving the language and the conversations about change. Um, a couple of th other things that I would say, um, and this is, goes from my consulting experience and my time at Royal Mail, um, change and transformation is all about leadership. It, there is nothing else, really. It is about the ability of an organisation to be clear about where it is, how it competes, how it differentiates itself, and where 
is it going? What's the journey? Is there a narrative? Is there a story? Can we engage our people on that journey? You know, I, I listen to leaders all the time, and one of the things that absolutely resonates with leader after leader of private sector or public sector organisations that have been successful is they all create a narrative around their organisation. And what I mean by a narrative, they say, this is where we are, and this is what we're going to be as an organisation. And it's a journey. And it's normally an ambitious journey. It isn't just about we're going to be a bit better than we are today. It's about taking people outside of their comfort zones. Creating an organisation where people can be at their best. And that means you need to inspire people. And you need to try and take people with you. So one of the things that I would be saying to you as a, an HR community is you choose where you work. And if you want to work in an organisation that's going through uh, transformation and you want to be part of a successful team, then you pick who you work for. So look seriously at the leaders, not just of the, the institution, but of the functions and the departments. Because again, that's as critical in your organisations as the overall uh, um, leadership of the organisation. Two things, it says on the slide, so I don't really need to uh, say it particularly, but it is about two things for me. Um, World-class leadership can articulate that journey and can create a competitive strategy which gives you an advantage in the marketplace. That's one part of the job, but they can then execute it. You know, I go around organisation after organisation when I was in consultancy, and they fell into two parts quite often. People that could talk a great game, but actually couldn't bring it to reality, or people that were quite good at changing stuff on the ground, but actually didn't quite know where they were going. And in reality, great leadership brings those two things together. That narrative, that picture, but also is about making it happen. Great leaders can make it happen. Build great teams around them, very clear about measure, and actually make things happen on the ground. And again, I think that's one of the challenges for you. When you look into the eyes of your leaders, have you really got people that you think they can articulate the journey for us, and they're actually going to help us you know, make this happen? And the other things, I suppose, is in any kind of transformational journey, and I'll talk about Royal Mail in a minute, is in reality, it goes wrong. It always goes wrong. It's never a perfect linear line. You know, change is one of them things that oscillates. You know, are we on the right tra trajectory? Are we getting where we're trying to get to? The journey will be, feel quite different. But what that means is you've got leaders that are resilient and can take that change and can actually say, we will be quite agile. We're not going to quite get there the way that we anticipated, but we're still going to get in that direction. And then actually when the times come difficult and there's resistance, because there always is, it comes in different shapes and sizes, that they actually are prepared to see it through. Because there's nothing worse, and this is what I see in public sector organisations quite a lot, we actually start off with vigour and enthusiasm, we get everybody on the boat, and everyone's quite passionate, and then it gets a bit choppy and all of a sudden we turn the boat around and we head in the other direction. And what you then get... It's very difficult to take your people with you if you keep turning the, the boat around in the direction. You know, we're, we're going over here, honestly, trust me, this is going to be brilliant. This is, and then actually within you know, six months, you, know, you get uh, you know, the numbers don't work or something goes wrong or the staff start to say they don't want to do it in the way that you want them to do it. And they go, OK, well, we'll, we'll compromise on this and we'll compromise on that. But actually, doesn't that mean the boat's turning around and going in a different direction? Well, yeah, we can sort of live with that. Because actually your people will see through that. So great leaders are authentic, and people know that. Your people, you, and your people will know great leadership when you see it, because it's the people that are prepared to say, you know, I'm afraid sometimes they're tough. This is how it's going to be. You know, change isn't about consensus. You've got to take people with you, the majority of people, but sometimes it's making unpopular decisions. You know, if you've got a leader that wants to be popular and loved, trust me, you're not going to lead a fantastic piece of transformational change. Because sometimes it's a lonely place, being a leader in an organisation going through radical change. So it's a bit about leadership. And I'm going to talk a bit more about HR. But uh, for me, uh, I'm a great lover of our profession. Um, I spent all my working li life in it. Um, and when, HR, when an organisation is going through transformation, there are some fundamental principles, I suppose, or things that I think you have to ask yourselves. One is, actually, have we got the capability to lead this and be part of it? You know, so you have to, before you start changing the organisation, you've got to look at yourself. Have we got a world-class HR function? If this is going to be a world-class uh, institution, it's going to compete globally, have I got a world-class 
HR function. And if you haven't, then build the team to get, you know, get there. Because actually, if you're going to take, they go on this journey with a leader that's clear or leaders that are clear about where they're taking you and you haven't got the team, you know, you as a function will be part of the, uh, the, the structure, the infrastructure that uh, means that the change doesn't happen. Always role model the change. Everybody looks at HR because we talk about change management, we'll talk about changing reward, we'll talk about culture, but actually we sort of don't change ourselves very well. So one of the things I always say to HR, you want to change an organisation, change your own function first. Show them what pain looks like. Show them that you're prepared to make tough decisions. You're prepared to let people go and bring in new talent. Change your structures, take costs out, organise yourselves differently. Because once you've done it, you build up your credibility to then manage change in the rest of the organisation. If you go around saying, actually, it's everybody else has got to change, we're sort of OK. They'll always see you as one of them things that, you know, they're part of the organisation that speaks a great game but really doesn't do it themselves. So build your credibility internally. Um, facilitate the strategy development process. I think this is critical. Uh, and what I mean by that is how do you develop strategy or your organisation's thinking about how it competes, what its areas of expertise are, I think the HR function should own that. And what I mean by that is if change is about taking people with you on a journey, it's about engagement, then we need to actually engage our people in an adult conversation. And I'll tell you about some of the stuff we did at Roma. How do you engage 104,000 posties in a debate about the organisation? We did that. How do we involve 73 factories that predominantly work a night shift? Quite hairy places to go. How do we engage them in a debate about who's the customer and what we need to change and how we need to change it? Well, actually, the strategy process needs to be engaging. Everybody in the organisation needs to have a voice and be able to participate in it. Because that's how you educate them. That's how you get them. Treat, it's an adult-to-adult -adult conversation. Organisations, for, for me, quite often treat their employees, whether they're academics, whether they're postees, whether they're whatever they are, as children. Top team goes away sits in a hotel for four days, develops a strategy, and comes out and goes, right, that's the strategy, guys. And then six months later, goes, well, no one's following us. Why is that? It's not seeming to happen on the ground. Well, no one's been involved in it. They don't own it. They don't believe in it. Don't understand it. Haven't, don't live and breathe it. So actually, it's got very little chance of being successful. So strategy development, how, what we're going to do as an institution, how do we compete, where do we invest? Where we, engage your people in that conversation. So HR should run the strategy development process. Engaging everyone in the organisation in the debate about where we're going as an organisation. I'll talk a lot more about engagement later. But internal communications, you need, that needs to be part of the fold because this whole engagement piece, engagement of people is critical. So um, you need to own internal communications. And quite often there's one of those territorial battles. You know, internal comms is owned by somebody else, external comms, and they send out nice flyers and e-comms, but actually we never get to the nub of issues you know it's all quite nice and we tell everybody about everything but you know Alan Layton who I work for at Royal Mouse it's simple internal comms one line it's a sun headline they've got to be able to understand it immediately read it get it you have to be able to engage people in a way that gets to them emotionally as well as intellectually so you need to think about how you communicate with your people so you need to get to grips and own internal communication and I'm going to talk a lot about leading change I'm, I believe that as a function, we should lead change within organisations, not facilitate it, not follow it, not help it, but lead it, which means that we have to be brave and put ourselves in places. You know, I talk at CIPD conferences and talk about HR, and HR people don't really, I think, instinctively, naturally want to be leaders. And I think if you're going to go through some kind of transformation process, we have to be leaders. We have to be able to make tough calls. And we have to be able to stand up and hold the mirror up to the organisation. Which means actually, you know, we said we're going to do this. Actually, we're not doing this, guys. This really isn't working. And we need to do things differently. And you need to do that with data and evidence and information. And a really passion about what you're trying to do. So we'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, strategic change other than... I think it's interesting to think there's three academic models, and Linda could have talked to you about this uh, infinitum yesterday. But three ways in which strategy can be uh, developed. It can be designed at the top, implemented top down. You can have a negotiated process, or you can have a, one which is about innovation, engaging everyone in the organisation. 
The debate that you need to think about is the greater the velocity of change within your industry and the, the more that you have to change everything within the organisation, the more you need to have a, a much more engaging process um, with your people. It's very difficult to change an organisation using what I would call the mechanistic, top-down, leader is right approach to managing change. You know? It doesn't work. You know? If you're going to change a lot of things, it's going to affect everyone's jobs. So if you're actually thinking about, you know, so I'll use a Royal Mallet story. Every postie was basically going to, they used to work and finish at 11 on average, some finished at 10, but on 11, and we paid them till 1, every 1. And actually, the, one of the big changes, they were all going to have to work till 1 o'clock. So they weren't very happy about that. But it's, it's going to affect everyone. So you have to engage people in a conversation. So if you've got people, academics, that are going, well, is this going to affect my job and my terms and my, how I manage my research or the size of my budget or the size of my department? You've got to engage them in that process. But you can't do top-down change if it's going to change people's jobs and the psychological contract. You have to treat them as adults and engage them in the process, which means it takes longer, maybe slower at the beginning, but the chance of being able to deliver the outputs and the outcomes are greater. So you need to think about your process for developing strategy. Another way of looking at it, organisationally, is you look at it in terms of explicit plans, but taking our people with us. And again, I think change is quite simple. It is about having very, very clear structures and systems that support it, using new technology, uh, opening, closing offices, merge, whatever it may be. But you, it's also about how people view things about how people behave in an organisation. How do you want people to behave and do things differently? So you have to work with change on both sides. One's quite logical, the other's quite emotive. So when you're designing a change programme, we need to use some of the hard levers. OD, let's change the structure, change reporting lines. But you've also got to be thinking, how's this going to go down? How do I take people with us? How are they going to react to this? How do I get, how, what's my story to get them on board? How do I convince them to do this? What do we want, how do we want them to behave? So you have to operate at both levels. You have to have a hard mechanistic plan, but you've also got to be thinking about how do we do this? What and how all the time. So, change. There's no magic formula, there's no way of doing it in any organisation. Every organisation has to come up with a, its right plan. So I've shared some principles with you. And if there's one thing that you take away from my little hour session today, it's going to be the next slide. So this is the bit where I get you to just focus for two minutes, even if you drift out, I want to go ranting on about raw mail in a moment. And this is about 25 years of experience. And for me, change comes down to three questions. Three questions that if there's nothing else you get, you go away and you use in your organisation, I'll be delighted. Because they, every time I did a consultancy assignment, every time I did a project, as an HR director, every time someone came, comes with a proposal, I use these three questions. Now, as a chief exec, I get, you know, I've only got an uh, 80, 90 person organisation, but every day someone comes in, says, I think we should do this. What about doing this? will be brilliant. And it's the same three questions. And the questions are quite straightforward. Why are we doing it? Tell me why. Then tell me what difference it's going to make, and then tell me how we're going to measure it. And if you can't convince me, if you can't explain to me why we're changing something, if you can't tell me the difference it's going to make, and we can't measure it, then we're not going to do it. Every time someone comes up with a proposal, why are we doing this? Just run it by me again, explain, me, explain to me what the purpose of this is. Tell me what the difference is, and how am I going to measure it? And you just think about your HR plans. I used to go through with HR directors and HR teams and go, tell me your strategy. And we'd end up with a long, long list of stuff. You know? We're going to change the reward mechanism. We're putting in a competency framework. We've got talent pools. We're doing this. We're doing tons of stuff. Right. Every single major activity. Tell them why are we doing it? What difference is it going to make? And how are you going to measure it? Strangely enough, you end up getting rid of about half the activity because you can't measure it. You don't know the difference you're trying to make. And if you don't know the difference you're trying to make, then you're just wasting resource. You're being a busy fool. So any kind of change activity, new intervention, new sales strategy, new marketing strategy, new business strategy. Why? What difference? How are we going to measure it? Every time you have a conversation, 
One of your people, one of your staff comes in, we want to do this, I've thought about it, why? And if you start doing it, it's, this came from a piece of revolutionary sort of thinking for me. I was at a conference, it's about child development. And they said children learn by asking the why questions. That's how they learn from their parents. They just keep asking why, why, why. And normally after the second why, you normally give them an ice cream and tell them to go away. Because actually three whys. So why is the stars come out at night, Daddy? Well, I'll give you a sort of... An, why? And, and you sort of, then you're struggling. You get the three whys and you really very rarely get there. And this is basically a premise that works within business. If you want to stop the noise, if you want to stop all the silliness in organisations, why? What difference and how are you going to measure it? It's really powerful. So that's the premise I went into. So Royal Mail, I'm running a consultancy organisation. We're very successful. I've got clients like the Cabinet Office. We've got uh, TUI, we're doing overseas work, Unilever, uh, Lloyds Bank, many, many organisations. In most sectors, we had one or two clients. I've got a team of 30, I'm running a great organisation. And I work for an HR director at BAE Systems, a guy called Tony McCarthy. Um, and we changed this trend, we transformed his HR function, we outsourced it to exchanging, putting a business part, fantastic piece of work. He then gets the group HR director job at, at Royal Mail. He says, come and have a do a project with me at Royal Mail, Kevin, and bring your team, we're going to have a whale of the time. So we go along, and um, we start to look at, I'll tell you about the HR function here, we start to look at the HR function, and I've never seen anything like it. And the organisation is in huge crisis. And within this sort of, within about a month, he's going, you really should come and join this organisation. You should forget your consultancy business, you know, forget making quite a lot of money, flowing around, you're having a good time, come and work at Royal Mail. <laughs> and um, I kept saying no. And uh, they, they had two people, and he had this fantastic job called the Chief Learning Officer's Job. And um, I said, what's this Chief Learning Officer's Job? He said, you love it, you know, you've got all the change teams, you've got the, all the training and development team, um, you've got loads of results there. We had two colleges, 400 trainers, um, and we spent a fortune. But I'll tell you about that in a moment. But he kept saying this to me, and I kept thinking, well, I've always wanted, you know, I've done it, consulted on it, I've helped organisations, at some point I have to go back and do it, you know. I've been around preaching to people, like, do this, do that, and then they don't do it. And you go, God, they're doing really frustrated. So, big British institution. And the thing that convinced me was, um, I want to see Adam Crozier as the chief exec. And they said, go and talk to some of our managers. And I went and talked to some of the managers. And if I'm very honest, I saw the MD of the letters business, the MD of the parcels business, and the guy that ran um, uh, the post office. And um, I wasn't impressed with any of them, actually. And I went back to Adam and said, look, I think that, you know, this is huge, the scale of the change. If you want to bring me in, um, it's going to cost you a fortune because I'm going to have to buy me out of my business. And I said, I'm not sure you're really serious. And he said, well, just leave it with me and we'll have a conversation in a couple of weeks. And um, he phoned me up and he said, um, uh, uh, we think you're right. We've, we've been looking at the management team and, and Tony reinforced this the same day. They tacked all three of them. So it's at the three MDs. And I said, well, OK, so we've got some real leadership here. We've got people that are serious about what they're going to do. And they really do want to create some change. And so I joined the organisation. So... Um, that's the start of, of, of this story. And it really is a story. I remember you, if you remember Jack and Ori, um, that's what I'm going to tell you. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the Royal Mail story. And again, it's a, it's a toy truck because um, some of the stuff I'm going to tell you I think is quite frightening. Some of it's unbelievable. Some of it you'll go, I don't believe that's true. I really do not believe this can be true. And it was, as I said, five fantastic years. And I think there are some parallels which I'm hoping when we get to some questions, um, we, we can talk about. So first of all, let's just touch on the organisation. Um, it's 360 years old. So first of all, when you're talking about change, this was the first incorporated company in the UK. First organisation to be turned into uh, uh, a, a proper uh, limited company. Um, and the other thing you've got to remember is, you know, um, it's Royal Mail, so it's about service to the Queen. And actually, you know, the culture is about um, stage coaches and uh, getting the Queen's Mail to its destination the next day. And culturally, the organisation was about, doesn't matter what we do, how efficient it is, the mail gets through. So operationally, that's what it's about. That was the mindset of the organisation. Doesn't matter how efficient we are, how good we are, we deliver the Queen's Mail the following day. So when you talked about changing things, 
That's your mindset, you know. It's been around 360 years. It's deeply, it's got a DNA which is incredibly strong, you know. We will get the mouth through, you know. It's quite a military organisation operationally. It was incredibly well spread. The Royal Mail set up every uh, international um, postal operation in the world. They were advisors. We basically exported our talent around the world. So we were a fantastically successful organisation, historically. Highly profitable. It made a fortune, the Royal Mail. It never invested anything. The Treasury just took it every year. Swept it into the, into the Treasury, never to be seen again. So no one ever bothered about the Royal Mail. It sort of did a job. The posties arrived. And it made loads of money. So we don't really need to change. Everyone loves it. People in the community. It was um, really respected and loved. You know, people feel passionately. You try and close a post office, you end up with, you know, you know, even in nice leafy suburbs, there are riots on the streets. There are grannies and MPs get very, very emotional because we're going to close their community post office. People love their postmen. And there's stories every day about the wonderful jobs that postmen do. You know, delivering, shopping, held, helping old age people, looking after people. Things they're not meant to do, but they do amazing things for the community. <laughs> but they were really, it's, they're quite a trusted organisation. So again, when you start to change stuff, the actual environment, the customers often go, no, no, we don't. We like it as it is. We like our mail arriving at 9 o'clock in the morning. We love having the same posting. We love having one of those dusty post offices that we wander into. Look at all the other products and think, I'm not quite sure what this is about, but I can, I'm really interested in you know, getting my uh, benefits paid or getting my pension. So a lot of history and a, a lot of things that have been successful for a long period of time. Then let's just look at the scale of what we did. Every night, 80 million items from one part of the country to the next. It is a huge operation, yeah? 70 factories, 2,000 offices. It all happens through the night, every day. Repetitive process. So we've got 190,000 people when we started. There was a lot less when I left, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But we do something about every street every day. So again, you know, it's a repetitive process, and there's lots of people doing a job uh, where they do it. And 20 billion items every year. But actually, if you think about the fleet, 33 planes every night, You've got more outlets than every bank, all the banks put together. Um, 115,000 collection points, a uh, bigger set of um, vehicles than the Russian army, and we all use them every night. So it's a big operation. So when you start to say we're going to change it, and you change one part of it, everything else then goes out of sync. So you're thinking about a big system here. It's a big system of, of how we actually operate and do what we need to do. Now let's talk about where we were in 2002. The business was now losing a million and a half pounds per day. Per day. So, the story is, that, and this isn't uh, public knowledge, I don't think even uh, Mr. Layton said this in his autobiography, but um, it was uh, on the cusp of being given to the Dutch for a pound in 2001 because the government didn't know how to sort it out. He'd been plinking around with it. So there's a conversation. Crozier, uh, not Crozier, uh, Mr. Lallan Layton had gone on the board the year before because they were trying to put some private sector expertise in it. And he went to Checkers one night and had a conversation with Tony Blair over a curry, apparently. And um, it was quite, a, there was a deal done. And the deal was done. I'll become chairman, but it, this is what it means. It means that I appoint my own board. There's no government interference. Um, and there will be strikes, so I will need you to back us when there are strikes, so don't wobble when there are uh, problems. Um, and we will run it as a private sector entity, and eventually we will privatise it, and, and, but it will take me five years. And, and Bless said, right, yeah, fine, we won't give it to the Dutch, crack on. So it's losing a lot of money. It's also got a service model that's gone wrong, so we're losing more and more letters. And if you remember the dispatches programme, do you remember that Channel 4 documentary? where we had lots of temporary people. That was when I, I was promoted three times. I was there. That's when I got chucked into the letters business to sort that out because uh, Adam Crozier had gone on news night and basically said, if we don't sort this out in three months, I'll, um, I'll have to consider my position. And chief execs don't like losing their jobs and certainly don't like being cornered. So myself and an operations guy were said, you know, you want to get sort out the big business? Well, now you can sort it out. You've got three months to get in there and do it. But we were losing lots of letters. We had the work, you know, strike action in the, the UK the Royal Mail had 97% of all the days lost in the UK. And be so, you know, so culturally, people just walked out. They didn't like it. Manager came in and said, um, I'm telling you what, we're going to change the rotors today. We don't like that, we're not having it. They just go. No ballot, no strike, no nothing. They're gone. And you know, I used to get calls saying, 
They're in the car park. Um, I can't get them back in. Can I give them some more money? No, you can't give them any more money. That's the culture. They just went on strike and we had to find a way of, of get, bringing them back to work. So we had wildcat strikes all over the place. Um, we had competition. Government did it the wrong way, as always. European legislation, we're going to have competition. Every other, you know, they haven't done it in Holland and in Germany. They've got very profitable postal businesses. Strangely enough, they haven't opened up competition. So we didn't invest in our postal business. We put a regulator in to keep prices down. And then we said, and by the way, we'll let the competition in. So strangely enough, that was one of the problems that we had in terms of that. But the employees, competition, well, well, no one's going to do my job. No one's going to walk up. Not gonna, someone's not going to be an operator that walk up every street. Well, how are they going to come? You know, they didn't believe it. They had no concept that competition uh, would come and what it would do to the business. But basically, we let them in in 2002, 2003, and it took away all the profitable work and left us with all the social mail, which we lose money on. So at Christmas, when you post all your Christmas cards, the Royal Mail losses go through the roof. Every stamp, we lose money. Hence the debate why we put stamps up, or they've put stamp prices up quite a lot, because it's uncompetitive. But they've basically taken away the profitable work from the businesses, which subsidise the social mail. You take away the private bit, then actually we're going to lose loads of money, aren't we? It's sort of so we had this. We had uh, the auditors saying it doesn't look solvent. It actually doesn't look like a going concern. Um, we had a pension black hole of three billion. It went up to six. So actually everything that we were doing was funding a pension fund. Every bit of money we made, we were putting in 300 million, 400 million every year. So we were basically a deficit pension fund with a business trying to support it. Any money we did put, we were trying to put into the pension fund. And the people. Um, we had suicides, rapes, um, we had the Equal Opportunities Commission came in and said they've never seen anything like it. You know, we had segregation in some of our factories. The Asian workers wouldn't work with the white work. I mean, it, you know, it was not good. So we had real issues with uh, diversity, um, and uh, I could tell you lots of stories, but it was pretty horrible. Pay levels were very low. We weren't paying much below, above minimum wage. People were completely demoralised. So this was the story. If you want to talk to a postie, they'd go, I'm carrying more mail. I've got 13 bags, okay? I'm taking out 13 bags on my round, and it's taken me an hour and a half longer, but we're losing loads of money. How does that work? It's not me, is it? It's not what I'm doing. It's something what you're doing up there, management. You don't know what you're doing. How can we be taking more mail and losing money when we used to make money? And they were right, weren't they? Actually, absolutely fundamental piece of economics. You're putting more volume through, you're charging the same prices. How can you become more unprofitable? So they were really demoralised, and there was a huge schism between managers and non-managers. Um, and let me just exact we had, um, we had a, two cultures. We had a, a culture at head office, which was very academic. We had more Oxford firsts than any other <coughs> business you'll ever come across. We had lots of people that chose to come into Royal Mail. Incredibly bright, very cerebral, and we did a lot of, quite a lot of good thinking activity. Um, but none of them people, ever, so our graduate program, our management programs were always about going to HR, going to procurement, going to IT, but they never went into operations. Never went into operations. Operations was hairy arsed operators, no one had a degree, and everyone progressed through the ranks. And give me, I'll give you an example of a change program, because I'm going to talk about change in a moment. We had a change program called single, um, uh, daily single delivery. You know when we went from two... Um, uh, operations where we went round can we went round every street twice a day, yeah? First post and the second post. And we wanted to get rid of the second post. We had a project team <laughs> in Royal Mail that had been looking at that for 14 years. <laughs> and there was 524 people on the team. <laughs> it had its own structure and they had a model. They had a, they had a model. This is what I mean by academics, they had a model. Every round, every walk in the UK was modelled. They knew the gradient of the hill, the number of houses, and it was managed centrally. And when we wanted to change stuff, the centre would go, right, we're going to go out and look at uh, Manchester 24. That would be Walk 24 in a particular district. They'd go out, the guys from the centre would go out, and then they'd go and talk to the manager in the delivery office. And they'd go, we've got a plan about how we can save some money. And the delivery office manager would go, oh yeah, but they've built a new development over there. And they go, oh really, that's going to muck up our model. <laughs> and he'd say, and, um, the postie that's doing it now, he does it the other way, because he's found it much easier to go down the hill. Really? And I'll put that into the programme. They'd wander back, and you wouldn't see them again for another six months. 
14 years of planning the change. Big five projects like this with hundreds of people. Really bright, capable people. But they never... Uh, so the operator's job was to upset the, the head office. They, they loved it. They ran rings around them. Though we had two cultures. Cerebral centre, we know best, we'll think about it, we'll design it. We're very clever people. Here we are, stop operators, they don't know what they're talking about. They couldn't deliver a letter if they tried. So you had that type of culture in play. HR, <laughs> there was a lot of them and we spent a lot of money and I'll talk about it in a moment, but in reality, everybody hated HR. The operators hated HR and the centre hated HR because they got in the way and they stopped things happening. Their job was to stop stuff. We had 83 um, national agreements with the unions and the only people that knew them were the union and an HR. So every time someone used to try and do something, HR would be the one that would go, no, I think the union's right, I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can paint your office without getting a committee locally to agree it. And uh, if you want to, you know, if we really are going to change the bikes, that will be a national agreement and we'll have to negotiate it over a period of time with uh, the trade unions because you couldn't expect them because of health and safety. So HR were hated. Um, so it's quite a good starting point, isn't it? Um, so the lessons, I suppose, um, was it was a, there's a history of success. It was always been profitable. The leadership, though. The leadership were basically, they were, you know, they were just managing it. It made money, so we never had any leaders. We had really bright, nice people. And I can't, won't name any of them, but if you go through, the chairman, the chief executive, the Royal Mail, up until Alan Layton, they were the sort of the people from the great and the good. They've done a really good job somewhere else and we sort of, we'll put them in Royal Mail for a few years just before we sort of, before we give them the knighthood and they wander off into pastures, you know, retirement or whatever. Really nice people, but they weren't really change orientated. They didn't want to make anything different. Their job was just to let it tick over. So, and that had created that central culture. Nothing had ever challenged it. Um, and they never made any tough calls. And actually all the competitive stuff had just been ignored. So actually the environment was changing quite rapidly around us, but no one believed it was going to change. Actually, we're always going to have a Royal Mail, and there's always going to be a poster walking up every street, and uh, there isn't really going to be any competition, and the government aren't going to really do that, and they're not going to change it, and they're not going to close any post offices. So in reality, all this is just some management scheme to frighten us and change things. So no one really believed it was going to change. Now let me just talk about some of the outcomes. People were are not engaged. I've told you about the culture. Thinking was rewarded. Everybody that got promoted at the centre was bright and very, very able. But they never did very much. So action, execution wasn't rewarded. You never got anyone from operations coming into the centre. They wouldn't come near the place. Because they were all action orientated. But their model was, we'll get the mouth through. Whatever happens, we'll ignore head office, we'll ignore the unions, we'll just do it our way and we'll get the mouth through. Because that's our job. Um, the unions were seen as a huge problem. Oh, obsession with structures. Well, yeah, they manage change. They manage change every day. And when they manage change, we change the structure and the reporting lines, but the people never changed. The same people who survived in the organisation for years. Uh, length of service was uh, 27 years in head office. Average length of service, 27 years. No one ever moved. No one left. But they would be changed. We've reorganised, we've restructured. They just changed the boxes and the lines on the graph. That's what change was. Uh, but they were always man changing the structure, but never making any change happen. Um, the unions, uh, they just blocked everything. The unions run rings around us, right? Absolutely run rings around us. They're two paid for by the Royal Mail, full-time reps in every office. Two, full-time. What did they do? You can't do that. That's all they used to say every morning to the, to the guy that would be running the office. It was normally guys, sometimes uh, women, but predominantly guys. We want to do this, we're going to change. You can't do that. I've got this agreement, that agreement. We need to negotiate it. We'll set up a subcommittee. They just blocked everything. They did the rotary. They told people when they would work. They used to phone people up and say, you haven't used your sick, you haven't used your sick leave. You need to take the next fortnight off. Oh, and by the way, we'll dish out the overtime between us. You know, it's unbelievable. They ran the operation. The managers just were basically, they normally give up. After about five years, they'd come in with enthusiasm. Well, I'm going to be the one that changes this. And after five years, they just gave up. Because the organisation didn't really want them to change. Overuse of consultants. They were spending £300 million a year on external consultants. Because we, we couldn't do anything. So apart from all these bright, sleeper people, we'd have PA come into a project. We had McKinsey doing strategy. We had uh, Bain doing stuff on 
international overseas operation. We were doing all sorts of things. And because we couldn't change anything at home and we were profitable, what do you think we spent our money on? We bought minority shares in most postal businesses around the world. No control. Fantastic. It was a fantastic opp opportunity to spend the, uh, the money that we had on investing in other uh, parts of the organisation. Um, so I think you've got a picture of where we were. So I'm now going to start to talk about um, uh, what we did and how we went about changing things. So change was just very, very quickly. It was big projects managed from the centre. It was painful. It was slow. And everything needed to be negotiated. That was the model of organisational change. Central, big, slow, painful. So this was, so I went in, as you do, I'm a consultant. Remember I've been 15 years and I said, well, we've got to have a model, haven't we? You know, I'm a consultant, I can't work in without. So we spent some time creating some, uh, a model of change. And this is, it's very simple. And um, you can either see this as um, uh, deep strategic thinking, or you can see it, as I saw it, is we pinched some really good ideas from a couple of people and used them. So the first one at the bottom is some work that uh, William Bridges did about uh, how human beings change. Um, you know, the whole bereavement cycle and, and stuff like that. And we made it very, very simple. So A, B, C. Because we were going to create a set of tools that we gave to the line managers who were going to manage change in the organisation. So our thing was we were going to descend, we broke down the centre and empowered the line was our basic premise. So to do that, we need to tell them they were managing change. We got rid of the HR people, and I'll come to that in a moment. So we need to create a tool. So basically, when you're managing change, you create awareness and understanding, you try and work and get belief and buying, you get commitment. That's what you've got to do with your people. Get them to understand it, get them to buy in, get them to actually take action with you. That's your job. You're managing the change. Then we gave them a set of tools, and we nicked Cotter's work. Nothing right there, which is you know, a project management approach to managing change. Increase the urgency, get a team, be clear about where you're going, communicate and involve, empower people, get some short-term wins, don't let up, make it stick. Simple stuff. So every manager got a set of books and we ran training courses. This is how you manage change in your office. You use that methodology and that's what you do with your people. The stuff in the centre was the yin and the yang, which was about us. It was about the centre, what we were going to do. And I'm not going to go into huge amounts. We did loads of stuff around leadership and change of performance management stuff, but... In reality, the core was those two things. State where you are, state where you're going to get to. Tell us what difference you're going to make and why you're going to make it. Take your people with us. Give us a project management methodology that can work at a local level. So that was the change model. The HR function. Now, I did say I'd start with this. Um, we, had, we stopped counting at 4,000 HR people. 4,000 HR people we had in, in Royal Mount. 4,000. Um, and we had people everywhere. And it was because they were getting in between line managers. Line managers didn't manage the people. HR tried to manage the people, and they were dealing with the trade unions. Um, we had a budget of 153 million, just the HR function. Some of your institutions most probably turn over that amount of money. Um, and I couldn't believe it. You know, when you come in and you come from outside and go, when we got to fourth, and when I say we stopped counting because we just couldn't believe it, we find groups of people, thousands of people, hundreds of people. What are these people doing, you know? Our processes were all linear, you know, with payroll was difficult, you know, 200,000, 190,000 people, all paid weekly, all different, you know, everything was complicated, everything was big, but there was thousands and thousands of HR people. Um, <laughs> now, um, and it was all about IR, it was all about industrial relations, and the line managers didn't like us, we got in the way, and no one was managing the people. We moved to an Ulrich model in six months. So this is what we decided to do, we were going to transform HR first. So we said, we're going to take 40% of the people out, we're going to do it in six months, and we're going to use a completely different model. Now, this is when you talk about being brave and taking some changes. Everybody, the line particularly, said, you're never going to do it. We don't believe you. So we had to do it. It was painful. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of good, committed HR people that had been in the organisation a long time. But our model was, unless we show what it looks like, unless we can do it in the right way, Actually, the line, no one else is going to believe us. So we had to actually do this. We took £57 million of the budget out in a year, um, and we brought in new capability. And what I mean by brought in new capability is we brought in lots of people to do different jobs in HR. So we actually brought in a, about 150 new people, predominantly from private sector. And you know how we got them in? We start, our, our brand, our employer brand was 
you'll never believe it. <laughs> and that was the catch line. And people said, what do you mean? You'll never believe it, what, it's good, what we're going to ask you to do, and what it looks like, and what it feels like. But if you're interested in doing something big, and hairy, and audacious, then you might be, you might be up for it. So actually, do you want to get in involved, and do you want to do something quite special? We're going to turn this thing round in three years. It's big, it's a great institution, people love it, we love it, we want to keep the heritage, but we want to change it, and we want to change it fast. Now, first thing we did was to focus on engagement. So basically, as I said, the line didn't do a lot, and the union did a load. So historically, this was what happened. Royal Mail Group used to talk to employees occasionally, uh, talk to the trade union all the time in negotiations. I mean, my diary when I arrived there, when I took over the letters business HR, I just met the union day in, day out about different things. That was the focus. The union talked to senior management, and the union spent its time talking to the employee. How did every member of every post you know what was going on? The union told them. Who sorted out what work they did, when they turned up, when they took the holiday? The union did. So the fundamental premise was spend a lot less time talking to the union, talk to your people, day in, day out. And that was about saying, we're going to, so head office, I'll, I'm, I must just tell you this. We, um, we reduced it by 60% in uh, a year. So all of those cerebral people and all those people, we just dismantled them and brought lots of new people in. So it was a painful piece of change, a real horrible piece of change that we had to do. And why we had to do it, though, was because we wanted the line managers to actually have the conversation with the employees. So we only need the line managers to talk day in, they had to have huddles, we sent them tools, we get, put them through programs and line managers, you manage performance, you're responsible for the office. And I'll tell you a lot about how we did some of that. So how did we do it? First of all, um, we needed to get some, some messages over um, and get people engaged and working with us. So we basically, uh, even though we were losing a million pounds a day, we increased the pay of all frontline staff quite significantly. And we did that because it was about symbolism. It was about, we think you are underpaid, we're going to pay you what we think is the going rate for the job, but we're going to change a lot of things and we're going to ask you to come with us. That was the first thing we did. Um, we, uh, sharing success was a sort of like, um, so basically, as soon as we get to profit, 25% of all profit goes back to you, the employees. They didn't believe us. But that was about getting them to come on the journey with us. So we improved their basic pay and we put in an incentive scene for every postie in the country which is if we get some profit, anything we make, you get 25% of it. To start to get them to focus on what profit meant and what it meant for them. Um, benefits for all, we used our buying power, so they could get cars at 20% lower than uh, cost, uh, anything they wanted. We did all deals with all the retailers. That was about trying to build a new relationship with them. We can give you benefits. Work here, this is what we can do to make your life a bit better. Anything that we could find where we could use our buying power to give them benefits, we did. You most probably remember the absence scheme. I don't know if any of you remember that. Absence was about 11%. Um, Every 1% of Royal Mail meant that um, if we reduced it by 1%, another £50 million pounds dropped to the bottom line because of so many staff. And because every time someone was off, we had to pay overtime. So you end up with a double whammy, right? So it's a big thing, absence. So we did hard and soft change. We put in a new contact strategy. Line manager had to phone up. Day they were off sick. Why you're off sick. Get your note and all of that stuff. Put in the hard bit. However, soft change. I went to the board and said, we want to give 39 cars away, 39 Astras. And the plan was this. And they laughed at me at the beginning, as you can imagine. So the plan was this. In every office, 31 regions and some head office functions, we put everyone's name in a hat that hasn't had a day off in six months. We pull out a name, they get a car. And you've got to be in it to win it. That was the message to our people. You've got to be in it to win it. Don't take any sick time off for six months and you might win a car. And Alan Layton used to go around and present cars to people. They loved it. Alan liked doing it, surprisingly. But when he went to a factory or one of his offices, they'd all come out and he'd have his picture taken with them. And then we did cruises the next time. Doesn't matter. Cost us a couple of million pounds, but 1%. We reduced it from 11 to 5. 350 million pound of profit by investing. So you've got to be a bit creative and do things slightly different. But the line liked it. Because all of a sudden, their numbers were getting better. They weren't spending as much on overtime. Because HR can't a bit of a good wheeze. That's quite like We want to like that. Do you know what I mean? So how, you, how do you build your credibility? How do you build the relationship? Frontline staff loved it. Communication. Every manager, every day, had to do a 15-minute session. Every week, they had to do one work time listening and learning session. And we gave them maps of what to do. 
So it was basically every week would be a printed uh, map about these are the big messages, this is what's going in the organisation, and basically we gave it to every line manager and they ran the half-time work time listening and learning session. Do you know what that was about? We were communicating before the union. We were giving our managers the information our people wanted. So we had, and actually then people started to turn up and ask questions and ask their managers. Their managers all of a sudden were quite interesting characters because they knew what was going on. So we ended up with doing lots of that. We sent newspapers to home, we put out a new magazine. Every month we had employee feedback and we used it. And we gave the man information to the managers and it's hard. This is the hard bit of change. Every line manager in an area, look at your bottom 10% based on employee satisfaction and go around and find out what's going on. Develop a program and if they're bottom three months, we want you to know what you're doing performance management. Hard. So managing performance based on feedback from employees. Union sabotaged it at the beginning. We couldn't understand why all our good managers were getting terrible scores. But that's because the union told everyone to <laughs> tick the wrong box and we'll get rid of them. So we had to be a bit clever. But I mean, that was the sort of games that were going on. But then we had this stuff with managers. So everyone said, it's all about line managers. So we used to get rooms like this. We used to hire, um, we, had, uh, we did Royal Albert Hall, we did uh, National Motorcycle Museum, all around the country, and we used to have to run three days of management briefings. Alan, the chairman, Adam, the chief exec, and it would be frontline managers. Guys running post offices, shifts in factories. There's thousands of them. That's why it took three days. We had to do four sessions a day. And it would be 15, 20 minutes from Alan, this is what's going on, this is what we're talking to government, this is what they're doing. And then it was questions from the floor. And I mean, it was unbelievable. So what do you want us to do? See your hands go up. I can't buy a clock without getting permission for this. Trade union all over, what you? And basically Alan just made decisions, there and then, in the room, with the managers. Cut out, he ignored the head office. I'm not gonna talk to head office, don't care what procurement says, this is what we're doing now. I'm going to give you a budget, £500 a week. You spend it on what you want to spend it on, as long as the business is improving. So we took out all the communication between frontline operational managers and the top of the organisation. But give them the confidence to do what we wanted to do. So we're giving them the skills, we're giving them the training, but we made Alan and Adam completely visible to frontline managers. And it, the centre hated it with a passion. Every, I used to hate it as well, I must admit. I used to have to organise it, but I knew that there'd be loads of stuff about HR. Performance management for crap, forms crap. Right, we're going to have one page form, get it done. That's how we manage the organisation. And that's what we had to do. So you'd get out of these sessions, every two months, you'd get like management, like a little bible will come out, and that's what we were going to do. Because our job was to support the frontline managers. There was nothing else more important. We were there, we were called a support centre. Interesting. Change the language. Head office, no. Support saying. We support the operational managers to do what they need to do. They run the business. You're there to help them. Not get in the way, not stop them. Fascinating. Fascinating. Best thing we did. That, I think, actually. Going back, looking back. Um, we, we, proved that we tried really hard with the trade unions. We knew we were going to end up in a dispute, but we gave the thought, well, you have to demonstrate and live your values, which is, we'll start working with everybody in the organisation. So we had national group, we paid McKinsey to work with them on strategy, we got occupational psychologists to work with them on a whole range of different issues, basically helping them think about their business plan, because we knew we were going to shrink the organisation, that meant the union would become unviable because they wouldn't have enough members, because I guess they got cost based on their current projection. So we put a new IR framework, 83 agreements down to one. Uh, we put single, remember single daily delivery, 14 years in the planning? Remember when we changed the second post? Most of you as a customer will remember this, it was horrible. But do you know what we did? We said, forget the model. We're putting it in on, we named a date, in three months' time, and we said, every manager, you decide how you're going to do it in your office. That's the plan. Local manager, you know your walks, involve your people, you design how you're going to do it. Change the whole model of change. Not centre, we don't know. We got no, that's why it was messy. That's why it went wrong in lots of places, because it was. But actually, you say, well, you've got to sort it out. You work it out. If it doesn't go right the first week, change it. Make it work the second week. If it doesn't go right the second week, you change it. So empower the line to make the decisions. Um, we did a... Uh, I'll talk about that another time. <laughs> first line fix. This is about giving money to the managers to fix anything in their office. Paint the office. A lot of them went down the dogs, actually. That was quite worrying. So we did have a few issues. The auditors come in and said, some of the money, we've got a team sponsoring their local football team. We had managers taking their staff out for big do's on Friday night, all sorts of things. So we had to put a few rules around it. 
But it was about doing them. We created a harassment and bullying helpline. So we did a lot of work with the EOC about how do we get diversity and, uh, and, and stuff. And we put every manager through training. We put every employee through a diversity process. So this is about does doing it for real. Um, but we also changed management processes. We used lean. So we, we educated our managers, you know. Lean, what Toyota, Toyota do? How do you take out waste? How do you make yourself more efficient? We gave them skills. They loved it. No one had ever trained them in how to be a great operational professional. And said to them, so we created you know, Six Sigma Lean thinking. We gave them skills. And then we created a little raw mail way, which is how we're going to change the organization. And all this was before we put the big technology in and the, the machines. Anyhow. So what would I say? Um, these were our messages to our people. Um, and, it was, and, and, and I suppose if we're standing back now, hindsight's a wonderful thing. I think the three ma ma messages are um, pretty sound, really, as a, as a, in when you're looking at change. First was live with duality. Um, hard, soft. Hard change, mechanistic, change the structure, change your processes, try and take your people with you. Live with du duality. We want to keep some of the heritage. It's a great organisation. People love us. But we want to change everything. You know, so live with ambiguity, duality we called it, but actually we're going to try and, you're going to have to work. So don't manage us, don't look for a black and white answer, we're going to have to work this out ourselves. We can't centrally manage it, so we're going to have to ask you to do some of the stuff. We want you to keep some stuff, we want you to change some stuff. So this was about us accepting it was going to be messy. It wasn't going to be a nice, orchestrated, lovely piece of change. Bring the market inside, so we ended up bringing customers in. Customer after customer, front line. The first thing, and I must tell you this story because this is a funny story, is so we went on for the first six months, a year of this change program, talking about the customer. And then one day, um, I can remember Mr. Layton because he, he, he swore a lot and, and, and he shouted at me down a corridor one day. He said, and I, I'm not sure if you're, he said, they don't <coughs> effing understand. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I've, I've just realised, he said, when we've been talking about customers, we think about the people that pay for post, the people that s send mail. Our staff think the people that receive mail are the customers. You go out and talk to posties, they would say things like, my customers don't want all this junk mail. And we're going, no, the junk mail is what's going to keep you in a job. So quite a fundamental thing that it took us a long time to get to grips with. They don't understand who the customer is. So when you start to think about change, think about your environment. You know, who's the customer? It used to be the government, and they're thinking about it. Now it's going to be these 17, 18-year-olds that are going to turn up. They're the customers. They're going to go, I don't want to go stay here. I'm going to change university after six months. I'm going to do a more interesting course. Or I'll go to Holland because I can get the same degree at a third of the price. You know, so who's the customer's interesting? Who do you service? Who do you focus on? So there's a big piece of learning for us. So bringing the customers in. We used to bring the consumer in, the people that receive mail, you know, you and me, plus the customers. We bring Barclays Bank. And Barclays Bank, we sat in front of the union conference, thousands of trade union reps, and they said, this is simple, this is the, 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 the best presentation I've ever said. He said, the bloke from Barclays stood up and said, look, it's quite simple. We post about, uh, I think it was 12 million items a year, and we use raw mail to do it. And actually, in the new model, raw mail is still going to deliver it. So your posties are still going to walk up the street and deliver our mail. But we're going to give it to someone else at the top end of the chain. So we're going to give it to TNT. And they're going to process the first bit. And then they're going to feed it into your system. You're going to deliver it. So my customer experience is they're still going to get raw mail to deliver it. And guess what? I get a £10 million saving every year. That their, their faces drop because they started to understand the customer's choice. Actually, I'm getting you to deliver it. But I can get it at £10 million less because I give it to TNT. And the union went, well, why would you do that? Well, we're lovely. We're what? No, I'm a business. I don't give a monkeys. You know, I'm here to do it as effectively and efficiently as I can. If someone gives me £10 million saving, they then realised that we were going to lose all the cross-subsidy. Customer after customer went with the competition, which left us with all the unprofitable work. So that was how you educate. Bring the customer in. Get them to say your messages to you. And create meaning. This is... A, uh, this is um, this was interesting. So this was some of the stuff where we really had to work very hard to get inside the mind of our people. Um, and actually, it was about, we, got, we wanted them to remain passionately and do all the things in the community that they did. You know, all the things that posties do every day that we're very, very proud of, but we want you to do different things as well. So what we had to do was, and this is quite interesting, and I think this does play into your space, we had to say to them, 
This is the bit that we want you to change. This is what we're quite happy for you to continue doing. So we had to articulate, in terms of people's jobs, this, we want you to keep doing this, but we don't want you to do this anymore. So, and actually, it was 80% the same, 20% different. So create meaning, get them to understand what's important for the organisation. Because actually for them, their contract is I turn up and this is the job I do. So being very explicit about what we want to change and what was going to stay the same was hugely important. So we created new meaning. There was a new contract with our frontline staff. That's in reality what we did. If you listen to the psychologists talk about psychological, we were explicit. And I think you've got to do that with your academics. You've got to be explicit about what stays the same and explicit about what's different. So they understand it, they get it. Um, so, the outcomes, 2008 when I left, we turned in a 750 million profit. So, during the 2003 five year programme, we went from losing five, over 600 million to making 700 million pound profit. So the outputs worked, all the activity delivered the result we were looking for. We got our best quality of service ever by Postcom, uh, so we were delivering a much higher quality of service with 97% next day delivery, which was better. Uh, we'd agreed to cut a deal with the competition, so we find it a way to make it work for us. We also put 900 million into the pension fund, even though it was still 3.6 billion. By the way, you've just taken that over, by the way. I don't think you understand that you've now, as in us taxpayers, have now got the deficit. It's past. It's fantastic. Government are fantastic. The government are very clever, you know. You know, they keep going on about privatisation Royal Mail, and I'm sure they want it to go into the private sector so it can be more efficient. But you know what they're really after? The assets of the pension fund. Because actually that change on the public sector exchequer just made a £20 billion shift to the positive. Because that's the asset in the pension fund. Even though it's got so the deficit comes into the public sector and it will be forevermore. There's no funds. You're just going to take it and pay out pensions like everyone else. But the government's got the assets. So they're very keen to take that on board. I just thought I'd share that with you. We got rid of 35,000 people but we did it voluntary. We didn't have to make anyone compulsory redundant except for the managers actually. That was quite interesting. So actually we lost 35,000 posties, frontline factory workers. We did that all voluntary. We actually were much harder with the management. And that was part of what we wanted to do. Because we need to move much faster with management because we have to demonstrate that we were going to be, we were going to do it to ourselves before we did it to them. Um, and uh, we put colleague shares in which uh, uh, was basically a share ownership scheme, um, uh, which is a precursor to privatisation. And we also got the, uh, the government to put 1.2 billion in which they said they'd only do if we could prove we could make it profitable. And that was about the next phase, which is the phase they're going through at the moment, which is putting in the kit. So they're still taking jobs out because we're actually putting um, sequences into the factories. Um, so that's where we got to. So if I'm playing back to what's my learning, or hopefully the things that you might take away, it's all about leaders. Would I join the organisation? Would any of the new people join the organisation if we didn't look into the white of Alan and Alan's eyes and think they're really serious about doing this? You wouldn't, because this is huge, you know. And actually, we, we, you know, you couldn't go backwards. When you start and stuff, you can't go backwards on this sort of change. So, but also, it was about how do we get leaders in to every part of the organisation and get them to buy into the narrative, buy into the way we're trying to take the organisation, empower them to make decisions. So we turned, you know, those 5,000 frontline managers into leaders. And that was the journey. And again, I think it's all about leadership. So every time you're managing change, have you got all of your, uh, I don't know, the people that lead, manage your departments or your schools or your parts of the organisation, are they all leaders? Are they all bought in? Are they explicit about what's expected of them? And do they make tough decisions? Do they manage? Do they lead? What should they do? Uh, performance has to be transparent. So every office, you know, like I said, scorecard every month, operational performance, financial performance, customer feedback, staff feedback. Every office, every month. And then we took action on it. So everyone took, performance has got to be transparent. So who's top of the league? You've got to know. You ask them. Who's the best performing department in our organisation? And if your managers don't know, you haven't got transparent performance. You've got to make it. Who's doing well? Brilliant. What can we learn from it? Who's at the bottom of the table? Who have we got a problem with and what are we going to do about it? If you haven't got transparent performance, you can't manage anything. Bring the outside in, I've talked about that. Focus on customer value. So that whole thing about who's the customer, how do we actually look at the proposition, what do we need to deliver for them, to really get the marketing speak into something which is digestible for frontline people. Change, what have I learned? What would I say to you? Hard and soft, always hard and soft. Hard and soft, so 
like absence. Hard mechanistic change, you've got to manage absence, give you a car. You know, we're going to change the structure, might mean you change your job, but think about the incentive we're going to get if we're all profitable. Hard and soft, all the time. Duality. Um, alignment to customers and, and think and always talk about competitor all the time. Who are you competing against? If you want to compete, you're going to be entrepreneurial. So we measure our performance, but we want to know. So we use metrics. So we went out and talked to the Dutch, the French, the Belgium, and we got all their performance metrics. And we used to hold it up and say, I'll tell you what, operations, you're crap. That's where you are, you're bottom. They are outperformers by 30%. What are we going to do about it? So who are your competitors and how are you performing against them? If you want to create change, what's the journey? You know, where are we at the moment? Where are we benchmarked against? You know, is it cost per student? Is it, I don't know. Number that get a further, I don't know what your measurements are, but you've got, and you've got to know your competition. So we're competing against them. That's who the student's going to look at. So how good are we? How good's the customer experience? Is our customer, do you measure it? So what's your student experience? Do you measure it? Is anyone rewarded on it? Do you sack anybody because the customer experience isn't very good? I'm not sure you do, do you? But you know what I mean? It's, hard. it's got to be real. If you play at it, they're going to play at it. It becomes an academic game, trust me. They go, oh, look, there comes the tables again. Oh, staff satisfaction. Oh, that's funny. I've only got 2.7. The bloke up the road's got 3.7. Nothing's going to happen. I'll carry on. What's going to happen? There's no consequence. I'll just carry on doing what I'm going to do. People do what they normally do day in, day out. You have to cajole them, encourage them, and if they don't, you know, you try and take them with you, but if they don't want to come with you, sometimes you have to push them. It's got to be real. It's got to be meaningful. Um, reinforce the line leads performance and change, so HR's job isn't to, to do that. Uh, bring in talent from outside and ask, get it to ask questions. We, we, that was brilliant. Because people would just turn up, you know, we bring in a new South and go, God almighty, how many people have I got? Can I have half the people and I'll just keep the good ones? And I'm going to make an assessment in the first six months and that's how we're going to do it. IT people come in and went, I've never seen anything like it. We're managing 85 projects, I only want to manage five. Fresh people come in with fresh perspectives. So you've got to bring fresh people in because they'll just go, this is nonsense. Because they haven't got any history, they're not tied up in the assumptions and what's gone on before. And projects, they go, absolute rubbish. We can do it miles better with half the people focusing on four things. The other thing, I've got one other thing that I always use, and I put it in the slides. You know, I said there's two, th well, one thing I should do, the three questions. The other thing I always do when we're talking about change is, this comes from a um, guy called Gareth Morgan, who's a Canadian academic who's done a lot of work at looking at major change programs. And he's, you know, when you distill his thought, it's this, focus on the 15%. And he says, in every change program, there's 15% that makes the big impact. Take your 20, it's the same thing. What's your 15%? Have you articulated it? Have you talked about all the things you're going to change? Then pick the one or two things that will make the difference and focus on them. You know, change programs, we try and change everything. You know, we had to change a lot at pace because we were losing a million and a half pounds a day. If you've got a book, you can move at different paces, depending on your context. And if I was you, I'm not sure how big your change is. I'm not sure in the next year there are going to be universities that are going to go out of business. Are there? I'm not sure. Most probably not. So if I was running a university, I'd create a burning platform. I'd create a crisis. Because if you really want to take people with... If you just say, look, it's going to be the same, we're going to have to save 5%. Everyone will go, oh, well, we'll just take a bit there, I can squeeze that budget, do that. That's it. Oh, we'll carry on. But if you think over five years, you've got to take 25% out. So actually, let's do 25% in one year. Let's do it quickly. Let's get ahead of the game. Let's be in front of the competition. Or if we're going to improve customer satisfaction and move it from 25th to 1st, you've got to take some big, decisive moves. Because otherwise, it just becomes incremental. It's hard to manage, hard to get leverage, hard to build a narrative, hard to build momentum. So you might have to think about forcing it. Um, I think I'm nearly finished. Yes, I have. So, um, how long have I got? Have I overrun time? Yeah. I have, have I? Sorry. I would like to, can you, if you wouldn't mind bearing with me, because it's, I've ranted away and jumped about and told you a mad story. I, I'd love to take some questions. I know we haven't got much time, so if I could just take, I don't know, three or four questions, just so I can get some feedback. And my question to you, what I'd be interested in, I suppose, is that thing about the scale of your change. That's what I'd be interested in, because I think... 
that's most probably about how you create your own journey, really. So questions for me. It could be anything, really. It could be about all mail, recruitment, whatever you like. Really? No hands up? I've got one. Any other questions? Let me give a few. Are you desperate to go for a drink and get to your awards, aren't you? There's one there. So is there a second mic? So if you do that one. Can I have another hand? Another hand? Another question? No? Okay, well, you go first. Hi, Kevin. Um, Angela O'Connor, uh, HR Lounge and REC member. Um, just wanted to ask you really about the applicability of some of the things you've talked about today to the current situation uh, in organisations at the moment here. So you've got HR people dealing with academics. Sometimes those academics have been around for years, are going to find change particularly difficult. Sometimes the HR people are feeling quite powerless. What would you suggest for them? Um, hmm, it's quite a good question. <laughs> Uh, I, I, think it's, I think some of the lessons are applicable. I think changes change. I think um, I would start with my own function. Have you really got the capability to manage what you need to manage over the next few years? And you've got to go through your own change process. So articulate what world class looks like in your own function and then change your own things. Because partly, I think that's one of the big things I would say, you've got to show the rest of the organisation how to do it. If you don't do it to yourself first, they'll always think that you're playing the game. So I do think it's about credibility and making sure you've got the, um, the capability to, to, to lead the change. The second thing I would say, I think, is get serious with your managers about what it is. And I think uh, articulate um, and come up with a narrative. What I mean by a narrative, I talked about it a lot. Um, if you're going to sit down with an academic or sit down with someone's managing a department in the organisation, how do you explain to them in, I don't know, two or three sentences why we've got to change and what's going to happen? Uh, and if you can't get to that, then it becomes incredibly difficult. So if you can't get to, we're going to be the best for, I don't know, student satisfaction, and we're going to save 25% in two years, so that we're the best university in this discipline or in this geographical area. You've got to have something that people understand because they've got to be able to challenge it and ask questions. If you're going to get people to buy in, it's about you create something where people ask lots of questions. Why have we got to do this? Why have we got to be number one? Why have we got to take 25% out? And that's where you go adult to adult. You've got to get them to buy in and have the conversation. So I think you've got to be very clear about the journey and your leaders have got to be clear about that journey. So a lot of your times getting in front of your line man not your line managers, getting in front of your top team and getting them to get perhaps really tie in articulate what this means. Because otherwise it will just be cut by a thousand knives. That's what happens in lots of public sector organisations when you take five to ten percent out. Everyone gets very depressed. Everyone hangs on to how it was ten years ago. It used to be brilliant here, now it's horrible. Um, and that's what they do. And you get fed up clubs. The fed up clubs are the little groups of people where someone starts off by saying, oh, I'm really pissed off. You'll never guess what they're going to do now. And you know what they do in a fed up club? They're looking for people to join. So they're there, say it in the toilet, or they say it in the staff canteen, and then someone else will go along and, yeah, I've heard that as well. And not only are they going to do that, they're going to do this as well. So you've got to think about, if that's going on in your organisation, what's your counter? Have you got a counter story? So can people have a, well I, well, I listened to the dean and he was saying this. He was saying, actually, if we don't do this, we're going to have a real problem with funding. We're going to have to close some schools. We're going to have to stop some courses. You know, you've got to counter it. Otherwise, they're going to win. If that's the art, that's what the union did in Royal Mount. They won every battle on the comms because actually everything they said came true. The fed up clubs is what the union did. You'll never guess what they're going to do. They're not going to give you a pay rise and you're going to have to work that much longer. Without the other side of the story, which is actually if we don't do this, we aren't going to have a job because competition's going to come in and we're losing a fortune. And that means actually we're going to lose our jobs or we're going to have to do twice as much work. So it's better to go with the grain than out the grain. So what's your count? How do you count the fed up clubs? How do you get little stories out there? Because they'll love it. I know, what you got, I know what, I can imagine what it's like at the moment. But if you just have the cut year after year and it gets worse, what's your positive story? What's your positive story? What, so what is it that you can say, you can sit down in front of your people and say, in five years' time it'll be better because? Because actually if everything is going to get worse, you ain't going to get anywhere. You have to create the positive story. It might, we've got to change stuff, but if we change stuff, 
then we can get more funding, we can do more research, we can be seen as a great place for students, we get more students, we're seen as successful, we can invest more in the organisation, we can invest... That's what's the positive story. If you allow the fed up clubs to dominate, you'll never take people with you because they'll never buy into... Because you haven't created another story, you haven't created another narrative. And the negative... Think of the press. It always means you tell people that it's doing... It's like the economy. The world is coming to an end. It's a double dip recession. Surprisingly, we're in a double dip recession. Is it going to get worse? It will get worse. You talk yourself down. The only way to counter that is you've got to talk it up. That's your job. You're involved in employee engagement. That's your role. Internal comms. How you, what is your story? And you have to work with your line managers. And they have to say it every day. Every one in management's job is to get the message over. Cross, that was a long answer to a quite a short question. <laughs> there was a lady there. Hello. And then this lady here with her hand up. Um, I just wanted to ask, at various points you said that HR should lead the change, yeah. and at other points you said the line should lead the change. What's okay. best when? HR's got to do the change to itself, so it can role model the overall change process. If that means you're taking costs out, you've got to take out costs, you've got to take out more, you've got to demonstrate you're more efficient. When I said the line's got to manage change, they've got to be the ones that manage change on the ground. So. Uh, in your place, it would be deans, presumably, heads of school. They've got to own the change. They've got to do it. What you have to do is you have to model it, do it first, show that you can do it, show you're committed to it, build up your credibility, and then help them do it. So support them. Not do it for them, but support them. Give them the skills, give them the capability, give them the narrative. You know, and a lot of the HR's jobs to give, build confidence, I think. So you've got to, how do you get your line managers to go out and have those conversations? They're not going to want to do it. I know they're not. You've, talk, you've talked about the Royal Mail journey. Yeah. You talked about, obviously, you had your strategic um, consultancy. Yes. Strategy uh, what, what's the journey been like for you personally in terms of going from theory to practitioner and your learning, you know, the learning points you take away from it or how you've personally changed through that process? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm passionate about everything I do. so. I sort of jump into things, I'm that type of character. So, and you reflect, I mean, I'm quite reflective as well. And I, I think what I've taken from it is, um, it's much harder to do than to speak about. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I gather, you know, I'm saying, look at this, it's easy, honestly, let's go for it. It'll be, so in reality, I know it's harder. Um, and I think it, it's given me lots of insights. So in my own organization, you know, I, again, you know, timing's a wonderful thing. The recruitment industry had grown by, 15% every year for a 15 year period. It was the second fastest growing industry in the UK. It was a 27 billion pound industry and I joined in 2008. And you know what happened in 2008, don't you? Um, so I arrived in the June, by the September, layman has gone down. What do you think happened to the recruitment industry in that next 18 months? Um, it went down by 30%. So the economy shrunk by 7% and um, our industry shrunk by 30% in 18 months, the overall industry. So as a trade organisation, my fund, my, all my income just evaporated. So strangely enough, I went for this nice, I was going out of Royal Mail. They wanted to send, headhunters are interesting, my own profession. They want to send you back to what you've just done. I came out and said, I want to do something different. And they said, how about Group HR Director TFL? Brilliant. Talk to Bob Crow rather than talking to Dave Ward. And get rid of lots of people. And they're not going to buy it. And, go for it. and they went, what about Northern Rock? There's a, you can help me. <laughs> So that's what they wanted to do. And I said, no, no, I want to do something different. So this job came along. But my timing was appalling. So I've had to do a piece of change in a small organisation. I suppose it's interesting. So I tend to be attracted to change. Um, so I think you learn quite a lot about yourself. Um, it took its toll. Uh, both, you know, it was the last year was incredibly tough. To do the pay negotiations, we spent seven, no, nine weeks at ACAS and six weeks in Brendan Barber's office every day, Saturday and Sunday, to one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And I was the poor uh, uh, sod that had the mic, you know, as you come out of pay negotiations and there's nine days of national strike and all of you lot are up in arms because you're not getting any post. And, uh, and it's interesting, uh, pay disputes is, at the beginning everyone's, it's the postie's fault, isn't it? They've gone on strike, it's unreasonable. After about nine, six, seven, eight, nine days, when are management going to sort it out? Because you're paid, you're responsible, you know? So um, that was an interesting experience. So what I would say is um, I've learned a lot about change. I think it's much harder to do, um, but you need to build momentum and you need to build, you need to get good people around you 
I think that's the thing. It's about teams. You can't do this with one good person, one good leader. It is about critical mass in terms of leadership and management. Um, and in terms of my own journey, um, I don't know. I suppose just think about what comes next. I don't, don't, I, I reflect, but I, it's just about what comes next. So you learn different things. Anyway, I don't know. I'm very good at talking about myself. Is that the end? Is there one more? Yeah. One more at the back. No, you're saying no. One more. Go, no, go and just... What's, what three things um, did you do within your HR team to change them from blockers to customer-focused enablers? Changed the whole structure, got rid of 40% and brought lots of new people in. So what I would say is, that's, that's quite hard, but that was because we had to do it very quickly. What I would always say though is, focus on fewer things. What are the things, what's your 15, what's going to make the most difference to your organisation? So be, don't be busy fools, focus on fewer things and put resource behind the things that are going to have the most impact. Make sure you get your best people in the, the areas which are going to have the most impact and, and, and bring new talent in and fresh ideas if you can. Is that okay? Um, I think I need to shut up.